Praise the Lord. Well, this is the beginning of our missions convention. We look forward to this every year when we see missionaries come from all over the world and in our own homeland sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, some that we have met before and some that we haven't. This morning we have Brother Thomas Correa, possibly a relation, we'll find out later, uh, from North Point Bible College. North Point, as many of you know, is formerly Zion Bible Institute. Uh, there have been many, many, hundreds if not thousands of people that have graduated that school and that have traveled around the world. I have some very, very dear friends that are pastors and evangelists and missionaries that have come through that school and have gone into the world to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, um, and we're very thankful, very grateful that that school is there. And uh, we have with us Brother Correa, who is representing the college, and he's going to come and share with us uh, the school and a message and whatever the Lord has laid on his heart. Would you please welcome Brother Thomas Correa as he comes. Yes. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That was such an amazing song service where we were able to uh, give our hearts to the Lord in song. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Ray, for your faithfulness uh, in that department. Can we just do one thing? Can we just stand up? And God has been so good to us that let's take 15 seconds to be able to just praise his name for who he is. Can we do that? We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for who you are. We worship you, Lord God. It is you who are the creator, you who are the beginning and the end, Lord Jesus. We give everything to you. Come on, 10 more seconds. Let's praise him for how good he is. Thank you that you are our savior. Thank you that you are our Lord. Thank you that we can call you friend, Lord Jesus. We thank you for who you are in our lives, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you are our Father. We thank you that we can worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord God. We can come before you with our faults. We can come before you with our hurts, Lord God. And you restore us all in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's give a, clan, a hand clap offering to Jesus. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Well, to let you guys know a little bit uh, about myself, yes, my name is uh, Pastor uh, Thomas Correa, and I attended North Point uh, from 2012 to 2016. I met my wife uh, while there, and uh, while I was there, uh, I just learned about God's love. And how God does not just call us to himself, but he calls us to be available, to be able to give his word uh, to a lost and dying world. Um, to be uh, an impact in this generation. And I loved... Uh, so much about being at the school and, and fellowshipping there that after two years of, of being in service to there, me and my wife had the opportunity to return back as, a, as an enrollment officer. And I've been at the college for about a year now. And I'm so humbled to see what God is doing in young people. I've been able to travel to different youth conventions and to see uh, students give their lives to Christ, students be filled in the baptism and the Holy Spirit. And most important, students uh, still say yes to the call of God in their life. Students that are going out. Yes, you can give God a, a hand clap, a praise offering. You know, I've seen uh, many examples. Just to give you one to, to highlight Missions Month, uh, my friends uh, Anthony and Ashley Vonaria. Uh, when Ashley graduated from North Point, we had known each other already 20 years, and she felt the call of God to, to go to India. And uh, she went for a year uh, teaching English as a second language and giving the gospel to uh, Syrian refugees that were in that place. And uh, while she was doing this, her uh, fiance, now they're married at the time. Anthony was giving the gospel to those same refugees in Sicily. And God was working in them in two separate places and brought them together. Now they are married. Uh, in September, they were newly married. And they came back, uh, took care of the, the visa questions. And now they are back in Sicily doing the work of God, giving the gospel to people who may not never hear the gospel message if somebody hasn't sent them. 
And we thank you guys for being here. We thank, we, uh, thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your prayers. We thank you for your love as we go to the ends of the earth and give the gospel message to men and women who do not know God. So we thank you so much for partnering with us. So to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, I am a native New Yorker, uh, but I'm not a Yankee fan. That's blasphemous in my house. It is blasphemous in my house. But it's okay. It's okay. None, none of us made the championship, so it, <laughs> it is okay. But one thing that you know about New Yorkers is that uh, they, they talk a lot about things that, that they love, uh, things that they find dear to their hearts. And one of the things that I used to promote all the time when I was back at North Point was New York pizza. How many people love New York pizza, amen? There is a holiness to New York pizza. Let me tell you something. Well, one of my favorite pizzeria shops uh, to be able to go as a kid was Luigi's. It was on 34th and 5th, and I remember going as a kid and grabbing a slice and grabbing a homemade Italian ice. So when I was at North Point, there were some students who had never been to the city. So, of course, me being the diligent New Yorker that I was, was we need to take you to Brooklyn, we need to take you to Luigi's, and we need to have a slice, all right? It was that word-of-mouth advertising because they'd never take out an ad in the paper. The owner would never do anything on social media. That word-of-mouth would be the thing that would spread the business and spread its popularity. If you notice, word of mouth is usually how most things are spread. When you enjoy something, you want to tell people about it. We already know that with the gospel message, when God transforms our life, we can't help but tell our family and our friends about the change that is in us. The same way that uh, me advertising about a simple slice of pizza but funny thing that I see is that there are more people that were advertised about a slice of pizza or a new post that's on Facebook or a new YouTube video that is out than sometimes the gospel message. And there are times that we need to bring back that word of mouth, which is what the title of this message is about. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to go to the book of Acts, uh, chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. We are going to be talking about the Apostle Paul and him being in Thessalonica and having that Macedonian call. And really, what the results of word of mouth, of spreading the gospel will be able to do, not only in the church world, but in the regular world as well. When you have it, say amen. amen. All right. Starting in verse 1, when Paul and his companions had passed through uh, the Amph Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath day he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is that Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are defying Caesar's decree, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. And when they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, we thank you for your word. 
We thank you, Lord God, that it does not come void, but it waters, Lord God, and it takes root into our hearts and in our soul, and everything is beneficial, Lord Jesus. I ask, Lord, that as we hear this word, that you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hands and feet to respond to your message. We ask all of this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Uh, the book of Acts was uh, written by Luke, a companion of Paul and the physician of Paul throughout his journey. Really, Luke wrote two books. R Luke wrote... Luke? Yeah. Some Bible scholars in here. They don't need to go to North Point. And Luke wrote Acts, which should be technically called Second Luke because it is a continuation of the book of Luke. It is uh, letting us know about the power of the Holy Spirit at first in Jesus' time in the book of Luke when he was ministering on this earth to now his apostles, disciples, and companions being filled with the Holy Spirit and being able to do those miracles and accomplish that gospel message again through the power of the Holy Spirit. So, as Luke is writing, and as he's on these journeys with Paul, he is writing a, just a, a little summary so that we now, as a church, can be able to say, this was done after Jesus' time. And if it's done after Jesus had ascended into heaven, we have that same Holy Spirit that is in us flowing through to this day. The Spirit that was with them is also with us. And the Holy Spirit is empowering us every day to get up in the morning, to be able to uh, live out the Word of God, to be a testimony to our friends and family members, for the people who are buying uh, Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts, to be that testimony to them as we are passing them by. It is is that same spirit that is powering Paul and Silas here in the scriptures. And as I'm looking at this verse, the biggest thing that, uh, that comes out to me as I'm reading these passages is that Christians who give the gospel cause trouble for the world. But the world will call it trouble. We call it progress. Amen? Amen. It causes good trouble for the world. And as uh, we're going through this, it, it says that um, Paul is, is traveling. He's traveling through uh, different parts of Thessalonica to get to a point where God has called him to. He has been given the Macedonian call. So instead of going right and heading back to Jerusalem, God has him heading uh, more west, has him heading more toward Rome to continue that gospel message. And he is spreading out. And there were times where Paul was like, God, I want to go back toward that same route. And God says, no, I need you to go this way. Because how many people know that when we go to a familiar territory, and when we go to some place that is familiar instead of the place that God wants us to, we also stop growing. God did not want Paul to stop growing. He did not want Silas to stop growing. And there were other people in this world that had not received the gospel message yet that the word of mouth was not strong enough to be able to say, I can give you this gospel. That the word of mouth was not strong enough yet to, to be able to say that the men and women in that community could be able to spread that gospel like Paul and like Silas did. So Paul had to continue to travel on. So Christians, us, men and women of God, who give the gospel cause good trouble for the world. And throughout this message, uh, I, I find a couple of things. Um, so, giving good trouble, that means that some people will be saved. That's that good trouble. That good trouble is that some people are going to be saved. Uh, back in uh, verse 1, it says that Paul and his companions had passed through the different parts of Greece and came to Apollonia. And it was custom that Paul went back into the synagogues. And on three Sabbath days, he reasoned from the scriptures. Paul spent three weeks with these people. And a lot of people think, oh, three Sabbath days, that means he, he, he did it three Saturdays uh, that Paul went on. But Paul was in the city the entire time. He wasn't traveling from different church to church. He was getting to know these people. He was fellowshipping with these Jews. He was fellowshipping with these Greeks. He was getting to know them on a personal level. 
Now, let me ask you this question. How many times do we in the church just meet somebody on a Sunday or meet somebody on a random day and debate with them about the things of God when we have no relationship with them? What if we took that time that Paul and Silas did that said, I'm going to work in that area. I am going to get to know these men and women. I'm going to open up the word of God to them and be with them on a daily basis so that the word of God can be able to take root in them. That is something that we all can be able to, to look and find and see and say, you want to know what, God? That person that I see every single day at Dunkin' Donuts at the same time that I go to get a cup of coffee, maybe it's time for me to shake their hand. Maybe it's time for me uh, to introduce myself. Maybe it's time for me to start a fellowship with that person because they don't know God. But maybe after a couple weeks of getting to know me, the testimony of God, a crop can be able to come from that. Amen? Let us be able to take that example. So Paul spends three weeks... Uh, pleading to them from the scriptures. And I love uh, uh, what it says in 1 Corinthians 2.14. Paul takes this in specific example. He says, the person without the spirit does not accept the things of God um, that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them. So Paul took that into account. And that's why he stood those three weeks. That's why he continued to labor so that they could be able to get not only the seed, but it could be able to take root so that they can be able to understand the scriptures and the things of God. Uh, the people who were saved uh, were Jewish people, were Greek people, were prominent women in the society. So the gospel, when it goes out, it goes out to everyone so that all can be able to be made disciples, which is what the theme of this entire mission's emphasis is, it's to the ends of the earth. Uh, like in Acts 1.8, um, again, when uh, Jesus says, you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, Paul is out. And as he is giving the gospel message, it is not just the Jews in the synagogue that the gospel is for, but everyone who is in that community. And everyone in that community in those three weeks are being affected for the goodness of God. And some of them are coming to Jesus. Some, uh, some of them are giving their lives to Christ and being transformed. How great it is to be able to see the transformation of the gospel in people's lives. So the good trouble is that some people will be saved. Another part of the good trouble, some people will be angry. <laughs> How many people know that some people get angry as soon as we start talking about Jesus in this world? It says, but other Jews were jealous and they rounded up some bad characters for the marketplace and they formed a mob and started a riot and they rushed into Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order for them uh, to bring them out to the crowd, but they did not find them. They dragged Jason and some of the other believers before the city officials. The Bible says that the other Jews were jealous. The other Jews uh, were of hard hearts. The Bible also tells us in chapters before when Paul is on his first missionary journey that there were always a remnant of Jewish people or uh, people who were devout um, to uh, the Jewish scriptures that were against Paul and Barnabas or against Paul and Silas. And how many people know, even in society today, that people can't just agree to disagree? disagree. Mm -hmm. Oh, you, you talk about society today. If I say anything, let's just, let's just take sports. For example, we just, we just, we just brought up sports right now. I brought up Red Sox. He brought up Yankees. We're both a part of the fellowship of God. And he's still, oh, oh my goodness. And me being Puerto Rican, that's blasphemous. I'm supposed to be a Yankee fan through and through, especially from Brooklyn. I'm like the anti-Yankee. Um, but when it comes to sports, when it comes to different styles of education, when it comes to different versions of the Bible that we read in church, um, people love not only to disagree, but they can't agree to disagree and be able to go off cordially. There always has to be some type of a pulling or a tugging when you're against something. So these 
these Jews, instead of believing that Jesus Christ is Lord or that there might be another way than uh, the original covenant, are stirring up people in the city, not just Jews themselves, but everyone in the city, to a point where this riot is occurring in the city. And everybody knows that when you disagree with something that is not of God, the enemy is going to try to take every single obstacle your way to try, try to throw it at you. He's going to take physical circumstances, financial circumstances. He's going to bring up an entire movement to try to come against you. But how many people know that in the Bible, it says when they were looking for the people of God, they could not find them because God had another situation in mind. God had another situation at hand. God knew that that gospel message needed to be spread in the correct way. So he put a hedge of protection around Paul and Silas. He did the same thing with Jesus. Before Jesus was crucified, it tells you that the Bible says that in so many instances, the crowd wanted to take him up. The crowd wanted to stone him. The crowd wanted to kill him. But what does the Bible say? His time had not yet come because God is a God of order. God is a God uh, that puts things in line and thing in perspective. And it's only when God deems it necessary for us to be able to go through a struggle, to go through the next chapter of him in his life, that we can be able to suffer. It is also God who brings us the time of joy who brings us the time of harvest, who brings us the time of togetherness, who can be able to see that amongst all this mob and this riot, there are still people that are receiving salvation and laying hands. So I'll take the 3,000 that are yelling against me if I can be able to save the three that really needed it and can be able to set their community on fire with the things of God. Amen. So some people will find salvation. Some people will get angry, and it is okay. The mob uh, uh, begins to form, because as we see in the Bible in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 33, bad company corrupts good character. They wanted uh, to be able to do it in the public square, in a place where they can publicly shut out this religion, but as we saw in Scripture, God kept them hidden. God kept them hidden. And Jason and the other believers, even though they're brought before the city officials, what the Bible doesn't tell us is that Jason and, and the believers were also Roman citizens. So Roman citizens could not just be put out on display. They had to be tried. They had to be taken away. Versus Paul, somebody who they had not known and was a Jew, could be uh, taken right into the public square and be judged right then and there. So God is protecting them in that point. And uh, this, this kind of reminds me of uh, a TV show that I used to watch as a child. Uh, it's called Phineas and Ferb. Uh, some of the other, uh, yeah, it's cartoon, yeah. Jesus loves cartoons. <laughs> Veggie Tales is an amazing thing, sister. <laughs> But in Phineas and Ferb, you had the older sister, her name was Candace, and the boys were always up to something. They were always on a new adventure. And every time that Candace tried to bring mom and dad around to be able to say, I caught them, I got them, I got them uh, doing something bad, even though they were doing just harmless fun, by the time she gets to the backyard, nothing is happening. And they're just sitting there by themselves. Whatever project that they did was dismantled. And they're playing like harmless kids. How many times do we see or do we often try or, or the world often tries to catch us doing something inappropriate? To the world's standards, not our standards. The world will say, I think... Uh, what you believe uh, is inappropriate, or I believe that there are many ways to heaven, or I believe uh, in this, or I believe in that. You can go ahead and keep your opinion. I have fact, I have truth, I have the word of God that is in me. This was not created by man. 
This was created by a holy God who, under the power of the Holy Spirit, gave inspiration to men to be able to write this. So this is not opinion. This is truth. This is fact. People were healed. Jesus came down. Jesus was crucified, was buried, resurrected. He stands at the right hand of the Father. So it doesn't matter what you find inappropriate because God is the one that has validated it through his word and through his testimony. Sorry, I'm getting riled up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so people will be saved. Some people will be angry. But, and this is my final point, all will proclaim the results. All will proclaim the results of this good trouble. The Bible says in Acts 17, 6 to 8, when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the other believers before the city officials shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. And they are defying all of Caesar's decree, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The world, a mob is out there. And the mob, the one who does not believe God, the one who believes that Jesus is not the Messiah, the people who proclaim Caesar as God, is going up to the city officials, not Jason and the other believers, and they said, this people, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here and they're preaching Jesus. The world will show you the results of the gospel given. The world will proclaim the miracles that God has done in the city because they cannot help it. When it is of God, it is inevitable. And these new believers that are being saved are impacting their community so much and they're making the enemy so uncomfortable. They're making the world and its citizens so uncomfortable that the world has to put them on trial for the thing that God is doing in this place. Let it be said of us that Meriden and Hamden and West Hartford and Berlin be so filled with God that we would be so on fire with the Holy Spirit that we go out and tell people and people come into the church and getting saved and the uncomfortability of the world and the uncomfortability of the enemy says there's something going on in that church there's something going on in that church I don't know what it is but we do not like it let that be said of us let that be said of here in this place that is one of the, the best things that, that I love being at the school that I am at. Because you have young people coming from all different places of the world. Places like um, uh, Columbus, Ohio. P places like Cleveland. Places like Brooklyn. Places like Hartford. I was a Hartford kid. I was raised in Hartford, Connecticut. I am not supposed to be here on this stage according to statistics. But how many people know that when God does a good work, when God uses his word and he transforms people, all people will be able to proclaim the results. They'll be able to look at the testimony of myself. They will be able to look at the testimony of my family and say they were not supposed to be there. But there is somebody, his name is Jesus, who transformed their life, who transformed their heart and put the Holy Spirit into them and were able to go out in spirit and in truth. Now I'm glad that I get to be in a situation where the, the children of God, the, these young people of God, have that burden, have that same calling, have that same fire, and I can be able to bring them in and we can cultivate them and send them out into the world. Amen. Amen. But some people will be saved. Some people will get angry. But the results are clear. The results are clear. When God does a work, even the enemy acknowledges it. Even the enemy acknowledges it. They sense 
Jesus' authority. The demons sensed Jesus' authority. And they could not help but bow down to him. That same spirit that is living in Christ is in us. Is in us right now. We can be able to see the blind see, the deaf hear, the drug addict saved and clean, the young person who is in that bad environment set on fire with the things of God and saved their entire family and community. That is the same God that we serve and it doesn't take 2,000 years of distance. There is no expiration date with the Holy Spirit. There is no, I have to say that again. There is no expiration date with the Holy Spirit. People are still getting up out of wheelchairs. People are still being healed. People are still being saved. And the gospel is being spread more than ever because of your faithfulness, because of your giving to missionaries like Pastor Brenda Lilly. I love Brenda Lilly and what she's doing. Um, Sister Judy Mensch, uh, who is at North Point with me right now, I can be able to tell you the stories of the four, the five, the six, the seven, the eight-year-olds who she has seen transformed by the love of God in the Netherlands where she went to go preach. It is because of your faithfulness that we get to be able to go out and give this gospel. It is because of your faithfulness now, how do we apply this to our lives? Because if we know the word of God, but it is not applicable, if we do not have hands and feet to respond, it's meaningless. Um, Brother Ray, if you could be able to put some, some worship music on. How do we apply this in our lives? Men and women of God, I plead with you that we not only need to be people of prayer, but people of action. We need a touch from God and a touch from His Spirit. We need to touch the hem of His garment so not only we can be able to be made whole, but that hem can give us enough fire to be able to spread it to the next person and be able to spread it to the next person. When the wildfires are happening out in California. And last time I checked, that wildfire is not contained. That fire spreads to the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. And we pray for people that are in that situation, that it cease. But what would happen if we were those fires? What, if hap what would happen if we were those fires? What would happen if we would set those fires in Meriden? What would happen if we set those Holy Ghost fires in Hamden? What happened if we would set those Holy Ghost fires in New Haven and Bridgeport and Hartford so that everyone is filled with His fire, with His glory, with His Holy Spirit, and the enemy can't help but say, these people are causing trouble because they're repopulating heaven and they're depopulating hell. So I need to come at them with every single angle that I can be able to do it. But how many people know that our God is a lot bigger than a devil? That a God is a lot bigger than a devil. And no matter what arrows he tries to sling at us, we can be able to combat it with a few simple words. In the name of Jesus. Oh, how powerful and how sweet and how amazing is that name. We need to rise up to action. We need to take on our spiritual armor. We need to come to these altars. We need to pray for a fresh touch of fire and the Holy Spirit. Won't you stand with me? Let's just raise our hands to heaven in a sign of surrender. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Father, we thank you. We thank you, my Jesus.
We thank you, Lord God. We ask for a fresh touch. We ask for fresh fire, Lord Jesus. We ask for more of your Holy Spirit, Lord God, in our lives, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Be able to call out to him right now. Be able to call out to him. Say, God, I need more. I need more of you. I need more of you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes. There are some of us right now that as we were preaching, you say to me, Pastor Thomas, I, ever I need a fresh touch from God because I feel like the burdens that I am carrying are too hard. Let me tell you, God does never calls you to have baggage. God tells you to leave that baggage at the altar, to leave that heartache at the altar, to leave that toughness at the altar, and that He will put His yoke upon you and it will be light. So as I open up the altars, if you have baggage of any kind, if you have hurt of any kind, if you have any anxiety, I ask you to come, that we may lay hands on you, that we may pray for you, that God be able to take that from you and give you His Spirit, give you that fresh fire and that fresh yoke. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We ask that we take this word that is in us, Lord God. And like the title of the message said, let it be word of mouth, Lord Jesus. May we go to our neighbors, our unsaved friends, our co-workers, and our family, Lord God. And through our word of mouth, through our testimony, through the goodness of Jesus Christ, we can be able to see them not only changed and transformed, Lord God, but bring the churches of Meriden and Connecticut to overflowing with the people. Turn this world upside down for your gospel. I thank you for the men and women of God that are here. I thank you for your faithfulness with them, Lord God. I thank you that you are constant in their life, Lord Jesus. I thank you that we are your sons and daughters, Lord God. Right. Lord God, I ask that you give them a fresh touch, Lord Jesus. Fresh strength peace and security in your spirit, Lord God. That as we leave this place, Lord God, we know that our lives have been continually transformed because of you, Jesus. It was nothing in and of ourselves, Lord God. But we remember that cross. We remember what you did for us, Lord God. And we are continually transformed by you and your Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus. I ask that you give us traveling mercies as we go, Lord God. And may your spirit consistently be with us and be a testimony to us throughout the week. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Pastor. Well, praise the Lord. Are you a troublemaker? I hope you are. I was a troublemaker my whole life. Always found trouble, always in trouble. I pray that that would continue and only now that we would cause trouble for the kingdom of darkness. We heard a message today about stirring up those in the world and as the King James says, they turn the world upside down. Are we, are we turning the world upside down? Are we causing a disturbance in the kingdom of darkness? Where you are in your family, in your neighborhood, in your place of business, are you stirring things up? Are people aware of the presence of God in your life? I pray that's the case. I pray that this message would, would uh, find its place in our hearts. and That as we leave this place today, we would go to cause trouble. Don't cause trouble needlessly. Don't be one of them. But, but by your testimony and by your faith and by your lifestyle and by your witness, people would be made aware of Christ in you. And... We would cause trouble for the kingdom of darkness and as the kingdom of God advances. Uh, friends, they're not going to know any other way. You notice there's no line out the door. People aren't begging to come to church. They're not knocking down the doors to get here. 
The Bible didn't say, come and sit in my father's house and I'll bring people in. He said, you go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I'll be with you as you go, <laughs> but you, you got to go. Amen? And these signs follow them that believe. And we're going to see signs. We're going to see people being healed and delivered. And we're going to see people being saved. And we're going to see marriages restored and bodies healed and addictions broken. And, but not as we sit in the pews. It's not going to happen until we do our part as the Lord has called us to do. Go into all the world, into our mission field. Mission field begins at the end of this driveway. Some may say it begins sitting where you are. <laughs> but that's another story. <laughs> but we want to we wanna see the kingdom of God advance. We want to see people being saved. If people aren't being saved, friends, then we just shut the doors and go home. Amen? Because we're not doing, it doesn't matter. We've got to see lives being transformed and that's what i believe god has called us to do we're grateful for your message today pastor thomas for coming amen please take it to heart please take the message to heart god wants us to go and stir up trouble trouble amen amen Lord, we thank you so much for your presence here today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the messenger who's come, God, to share with us and to challenge us and to encourage us. Lord, you are faithful. You've called us, God. You will also do it. I pray, Lord, that we will go from this place excited about what you're going to do and that we would, Lord God, be a witness for you. I pray, Father, that there'll be fruit that follows. I pray for Brother Thomas. God, I ask for his life and for his family that you will bless them abundantly. I pray, oh Lord, that you'll open doors before him, that you'll continue to anoint him, give him fruit, Father, that remains. I pray, oh Lord, for North Point Bible College, that people would still be called. God, as you're calling young people to your ministry, I pray that people will hear. If there's anyone listening here, Father, today, or listening by, uh, by electronics, God, that they would be stirred in their hearts, and God, that they will answer your call. We're just so grateful, Father, that we could be a part of what you're doing in the world in this day and age. Be glorified, God, through all of these things we ask. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.